Hey, welcome back everyone. Today we're taking a look at a rather peculiar but interesting rifle. This is the Carcano Type I, which was manufactured in Italy and used by the Japanese Imperial Army and Navy during World War II. The I standing for Italian. These are also sometimes referred to as Italian Arasakas or Japanese Carcanos. And what makes this rifle so interesting is that it basically has the body of a Japanese Type 38 and the action of a Carcano Model 91, so it is of interest to both Japanese and Italian rifle collectors. An odd rifle to be sure, but a very interesting one. Now before I go any further, I do want to mention that this is a continuation of a series of presentations I've been doing on the Carcano family of rifles. The Carcanos, for those of you who are unfamiliar with them, were the main small arms used by the Italian military from the mid-1890s up until the end of World War II. So I've organized these videos in chronological order of development in a playlist here on the channel, so I will link to that in the video description if you're interested in watching them in order from the beginning. And while this is part of a series on Carcanos, this is obviously more than just an Italian rifle, with its shared history as a long arm used by the Empire of Japan. So I hope to cover more Japanese rifles in upcoming videos. So the Type I is chambered in the 65 by 50 Japanese cartridge, is just under 51 inches in total length, has a 30 inch barrel, and weighs about 9.3 pounds of loaded. Additionally, it has a straight bolt handle, a bayonet lug fitted for a Type 30 Japanese sword bayonet, has a rear sight ladder that graduates from 500 to 2400 meters with a 400 meter battle sight and is fed using a five round stripper clip. So in order to get the full story and context of why this rifle exists, we need to back up to 1937. Japan had signed on to the anti comintern Pact with Germany and Italy, which was basically a cooperation agreement against international communism by what would eventually become the Axis powers in 1940. Other signatories included puppet states and allies of Germany, Japan and Italy, such as Hungary, Spain, Manchuria, Romania, occupied China, and so on. This agreement had a wide-ranging number of objectives, but one outcome was increased industrial ties between these powers. For example, Spain never joined the tripartite agreement in 1940 and remained neutral during the war, but remained inside the pact for its industrial and political benefits. Now, one of the secondary treaties that came out of the pact was the japan manchuko italy Pact, signed on July 5, 1938, and is referred to in a July 6, 1938 New York Times article as an accord among the governments of Italy, Japan, and Manchuko for regulating trade and payments thereto between Italy on one side and Japan and Manchuko on the other. One of the provisions listed in the treaty was to increase and facilitate trade between these powers, and this of course included military arms. Now, even before the japan manchuko italy Pact was finalized, the Japanese military was already looking into procuring additional firearms for its armed forces because of the constant need for small arms. Overall, the land war in China had already involved millions of soldiers and had dominated Japanese politics and military logistics for most of the 1930s. In July of 1937, Japan approached Italy about procuring firearms for their armed forces and entered into purchase negotiations with them based on Japanese requirements for a rifle. At the time of these negotiations, the standard long arm of the Japanese armed forces was the Arisaka Type 38 infantry rifle chambered in 6.5 Japanese, so the Royal Arms Factory in Turney, Italy drew up designs and options for essentially a near copy of the Type 38. Now, originally the Japanese asked for the rifle order to be completed by December of 1937, which was a bit unrealistic. On June 15, 1938, the Japanese Ministry of the Army received a telegraph from the Italian Embassy Military Attaché explaining what they could offer in terms of design modifications and costs for this rifle. Basically, they gave the Japanese two options. Option one was a rifle chambered in 6.5 Japanese, but it would have a Carcano magazine and could be delivered in nine months. Option two was to have it chambered in 6.5 Japanese and have a Type 38 pattern magazine design instead. This could be delivered in 12 months. Now, design option one was offered for 65 yen or 350 Italian lire per rifle. And design option two was offered at 75 yen or 400 lire per rifle. Now, remember that none of the military small arms factories in Italy had the tooling to make Arasaka bolts, so they had to use Carcano actions no matter what. The, the rest of the rifle, however, like the stock, barrel, magazine, could be made to match the Type 38 specifications. It would just cost a little bit more money. The Japanese obviously went with design number two that included the matching Type 38 magazine, as we see today. This means the Japanese don't have to bother with adopting and training Montlucker style loading techniques for units that got these rifles. 
Adding in a Monlecker M block clip was probably the last thing they wanted to introduce in their already strained supply chains. Now, the final contract negotiations lasted roughly three months and were concluded by September of 1938. The Japanese Ministry of the Army ordered roughly 130,000 rifles of the second design, as we see here, at a cost of 9.7 million Japanese yen. About 10 million yen was allocated for this program, so leftover funds were spent on anti-aircraft ammunition. And so the Type I was born. Uh, the Japanese referred to these differently in different documents and reports, which we'll go over in a second. The most common are the Italian Type I rifle, the Italian rifle, or the Italian-made modified rifle. Now, this agreement was considered a secret. Furthermore, it stipulated that these new rifles from Italy were for the Manchuko government for training purposes only. Manchuko, or Manchuria, was the Japanese puppet state that existed in Manchuria since 1932 when it was ceded from China. Technically, it had its own embassy and was referred to as an independent state in all these international treaties as a necessity, but was obviously under Japanese military occupation and, and had no real political independence. Now, the production of the Type I began in 1938 at Turney, where they first produced the barrels. Afterwards, the barrels were shipped to three subcontracted arsenals, the Royal Arms Factory in Gordon Valtrampia, FNA Brescia, and Beretta for completion. I'll also note that the Japanese sent 650,000 testing rounds of 6.5 Japanese free of charge to Italy. I'm sure Italy didn't have a lot of 6.5 Japanese rounds sitting around, so you want to make sure you get everything right. Now concerning the barrels, it was logistically easier and more economical to have one larger factory just mass produce the barrels in this non-standard caliber and disseminate them to subcontractors rather than needing to create barrel tooling at three different locations. It's just more economical and cheaper that way and you probably get a little bit of a better um, standard of production quality that way. And so the full order of rifles was completed by 1939. Now, the original documentation on serial numbers produced of the Type I has been lost, but the observed serial numbers fit into letter prefixes of A through L, with 9,999 numbers per letter block. This equates to an estimated 120,000 rifles produced in total. Now, according to a December 1971 issue of the American Rifleman magazine, the completed batches were then all sent to the Royal Arms Factory in Gordon Valtrampia, where Italian ordnance inspectors marked and accepted them. Then the Japanese Ordnance Commission gave the final physical acceptance before they were shipped off to Japan. Here is a picture of what is thought to be Japanese Army and Navy officers overseeing this transfer in Italy. In terms of the shipment schedule, they were sent in six batches between December 1938 and December 1939 with 20,000 rifles in each shipment. The fifth shipment of 20,060 rifles left Italy on November 17, 1939. The sixth and final shipment left Naples, Italy for Japan on board the merchant ship Suwumaru on December 28, 1939. The deal was officially completed on March of 1940 when Japan made the sixth payment for the last shipment. Now, the original terms of the contract said Italy would have the order completed in 12 months, which is really quite impressive given how military contract orders have historically been prone to difficulties and delays. Even more so knowing that the agreement terms were finalized in September of 1938, and the first shipment went out in December of the same year. Now, based on arsenal acceptance marks, we see that roughly 50% were made at the Royal Arms Factory in Gordon Valtrampia, 25% at FNA Brescia, and 25% at Breda. So, in theory, that's 60,000 at Gordon, and 30,000 at each of the other two facilities. As far as where Type I's ended up in the Japanese supply chain, which units got them, and if there was any combat history associated with them is still up for debate and research. But I was able to find several sources provided by the Japan Center for Asian Historical Records that cleared up a few things of their whereabouts. I also wanted to clear up this long-standing myth in the collector's community that Type I's were ordered and only used by the Japanese Navy on the premise that the Japanese Army controlled the domestic production of small arms and that the Navy had a shortage of rifles. You know, the theory goes that therefore the Navy needed to go out and find their own weapons. This seems to not be the case. The translation of the original contract terms and the communiques seem to contradict this long-standing narrative. While rivalries between the Army and Navy did affect Japanese war efforts, both branches procured foreign weapons to supply second-line units. The Type I was the result of a foreign treaty to increase trade relations between two close nations, and this is the primary reason they exist. 
Several documents from February 29th and March 2nd, 1940 make mention of 2,000 Italian-made modified rifles being sent to the reorganized national government of the Republic of China, along with 2,000 Type 30 bayonets to match the rifles. This was also known as the Wang Jingwei puppet regime based in Nanking, China. Other documents show that 1,000 of the same rifles and bayonets were sent to the Mongzhong United Autonomous Government. Mongzhong was specifically the name for Inner Mongolia or the Mongol borderland that Japan had occupied in various forms since the early 1930s as part of Manchuria. The Wang Jingwei and Mongzhong governments were both puppet states in mainland China occupied by the Empire of Japan. Additionally, here's an ammo resupply request from Nagoya 2nd Army Hospital on July 16th, 1942. The translation says that since they added 100 Type I rifles, they needed 3,000 rounds for anti-air use, 1,000 rounds for live fire training, and 500 dummy rounds for training purposes as well. Now, Nagoya, Japan was one of the targets of the Doolittle Raid just three months earlier aimed at military targets on the Japanese home islands. The Japanese were trained to use their rifles in mass as defensive anti-aircraft measures at low flying craft. Nagoya continued to be a consistent target of military raids during the war, so it's possible they were deployed in such a manner. There were also reports that the 61st Guard Force of the Imperial Navy defending the island of Roy Namor in the Kwajalein Atoll against the U.S. 4th Marine Division in early 1944 were equipped with Type I's. Some would have been recovered from the island as battlefield captures. From what I've seen, this is the only report of them being used in combat, but it's possible a few others that made their way to mainland China or Japan itself could have been fired in anger. This document here is a surrendered weapons list from the 186th Airfield Battalion under the Imperial Japanese Army's 13th Air Division, dated on September 10th, 1945. It lists 30 Italian Type I rifles being turned in. The 13th Air Division was stationed in the Nanking area in 1945, so this is consistent with previous orders. Now this document here shows 17 Type I's being surrendered by Number 15 Air Service Field Shop in Fungtai, China, the Chinese Army captured an additional 1,700 Type I rifles belonging to the Imperial Marine Forces in Shanghai after the surrender in 1945 as well. Going down the list, here's another document showing 563 Type I's being surrendered by the Hario Naval Corps. Another one showing an end-of-the-war weapons list from Zhoucheng Guard Unit, a naval guard unit from the Shanghai Area Base Force who were equipped with 224 Type I's out of you know, 1,370 rifles when they surrendered in October of 1945. That's 15% of that unit's total rifle use. Now, there are probably other documents out there showing naval unit armory lists, but so many Japanese Navy units were completely destroyed in the Pacific Theater, so we speculate that a lot of these records just don't exist. The naval records that do exist are primarily from units from the China area fleet that didn't see as much combat and were able to surrender after the war was over. So to bring it full circle, it was used by both the Imperial Japanese Navy and the Imperial Japanese Army, and seems to have been primarily issued to second-line troops in China, Japan, the Pacific Islands, the Philippines, and elsewhere as shown in supply and equipment records. According to Fred Honeycutt's book on military rifles of Japan, the Type I rifles he used as examples for his book were acquired from veterans who supposedly took them from a warehouse in Tokyo as war trophies after the war. So you know, more examples that these rifles pretty much made it to every major Pacific theater of operations. Now, many Type I rifles brought back to the United States as war trophies were reportedly captured at the Kwajalein Atoll, like we said earlier, the Philippines, and from Japan at the conclusion of hostilities. We're positive there's more out there in terms of records of where these rifles ended up, but regardless, many of them found their way to the U.S. as servicemen were returning home from the Pacific theater. Now, because most of these rifles were used by second-line units, very few of them saw combat, and most are in actually great condition. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at this particular rifle. Now what you'll notice right away is that the Type I has the cosmetic appearance of a Japanese Type 38 rifle and the action of a Carcano Model 91. Right at the bottom is a Japanese Type 38, in the middle is the Type I, and then on the top is the Carcano Model 91. For the Type I and Type 38, the most noticeable difference being the actions. The stock, barrel bands, magazine, bayonet lug, sling swivels, and other small details are replicated to the Type 38 specifications. You'll also notice the trigger guard is bigger on the Type I. As you can see, there are virtually no markings on the rifle except for some acceptance stamps on various parts and the serial number right here on the barrel. 
Actually, one of the first things you notice is the utter bareness of markings on the rifle. In fact, there is no way of telling if parts are matching because parts weren't numbered. It's really only the serial number and acceptance marks. There are no Japanese markings on any kind. There's no chrysanthemum that was stamped on the receiver. So it's pretty cut and dry. Just a serial number. So this is a Series A rifle, as you can tell by the A prefix here. So it was manufactured at the Royal Arms Factory in Gordon, Valtrumpia, and was one of the first 1100 Type I rifles produced. So this one was probably manufactured sometime in 1938. Now for the prefix letters, there's A through F, which were made at the Royal Arms Factory in Gordon, Valtrumpia, letters G through I, which were made at FNA Brescia, and letters J through L, which were made at Beretta. I mentioned earlier that the barrels were mostly manufactured by Turney, and underneath this barrel is a FAT stamp, or Fabrica Arme de Turney. However, there are no other markings underneath the barrel or receiver. On the bolt handle root right here is the number 28 stamped out, one of the proof marks, and then there is an FAA Brescia proof mark on the side of the caulking piece. Uh, you can kind of see right here. Um, so bolt assembly could have been put together using spare parts, but who really knows? As far as the Type I on the bottom and the Model 91 Carcano on the top, you can see that uh, it basically uses a Carcano bolt and functions virtually the same way, tube style, safety system, and all. Additionally, you can see that the Type I has a internal Mauser style box magazine fed by a five round stripper clip, just like this in the 6.5 Japanese, rather than the Monlicker style loading system in the Carcano Model 91 which would be fed through the top with an end block clip, much like this. So now we're gonna go ahead and take a look at the action of the Type 38 here on the top. And then of course we've got our Type I at the bottom. For the stripper clip, you can tell that the Type I has a split bridge rather than the full bridge of the Type 38. Um, and then I will also open up the actions and show you that they both have the five round Mauser style box magazine per the required contract. So even though the bolts between the Type I and the Model 91 Carcano are nearly identical, they are not interchangeable because the groove cut on the bodies of the two bolts for the passage of the ejector are in different positions. So the Model 91 bolt has a curved passage as you can see here, and then the Type I has a straight passage. And so the bolt faces are slightly different. Taking a look at the Type I's rear sights, you can see that it is V-notched right here with a 400 meter battle sight, and then this folding leaf ladder that faintly starts at 500 meters and graduates up to 2400 meters in 100 meter increments. Now comparing the rear sights to a Type 38, the sights are basically identical. I've seen some Type 38s that have uh, peephole sights instead of V-notches, so in a way, they may be different from different Type 38s, but they are just near identical. Looking at the stock, it's pretty identical to the original Type 38. Um, originally, the rifles were shipped to Japan with unoiled stocks because the Japanese wanted to finish them themselves. This one is obviously finished, but some were said to have never been finished and left in this uh, original condition. I do want to mention that there are two different reported rifle lengths. 49 and a half inches and 50 and a half inches. The Japanese shortened some of them from the buttstock end by one inch once they arrive in Japan. In Fred Honeycutt's book, he theorizes they were shortened to reduce the length of pull for shorter Japanese soldiers. Mine, however, was never shortened and remains 50 and a half inches in total length. I also want to mention that the stock is made of beech wood on the Type I's, which was a common uh, wood in Italy. And then the hand grooves on the Type I are just a little bit shorter than they are on the Type 38. Now the Type I's, just like the Arasaka's, the buttstocks were two pieces that were dovetailed together. For the Japanese, this was a method to save timber in production as large trees were not abundant in Japan, and they likely required this replication on the Type I's for continuity's sake, and I would theorize also in case they needed to replace them for any reason. The butt plate on the Type I and the Type 38 are just kind of your standard flat forged butt plates with the Type 38 uh, top extending just a little bit further. 
As we said earlier, the Type I was required to fit a Type 30 bayonet, which was the standard issue uh, bayonet that the Type 99s and the Type 38 rifles used. So there's no surprise. They're just continuity in supply logistics. One last thing I'll note is that the Type I cleaning rod and the Type 38 cleaning rod are near identical, but the Type I cleaning rod is just a tad shorter. So uh, you want to make sure you get one with the actual correct cleaning rod. And I'm not sure how easy those are to find. Now, for those of you wondering, I purchased this example of a Type I back in 2021 for $325. And you can still find these for under $500 in the U.S. collector's market. These aren't particularly sought after today unless you're an Italian or Japanese collector, but that could certainly change in the future. I also wouldn't call these rare, but they are fairly uncommon. I also want to mention that gathering sources and information for this video took a lot of time. I had a lot of help from the wider firearms community who assisted with translations and finding photocopies of original records from the Japan Center for Asian History. So I had the original script almost completely written out, but then after posting some questions about finding sources on gun boards, I had to rewrite a decent amount of information on the script. Much of what is published online and printed in reference book was often obscure, vague, came from secondary sources, and I wanted this to be really comprehensive on the Type I. There was a lot of information already out there regarding technical aspects of the rifle, but not much out there in terms of contract terms or operational history. And this is what I really wanted to highlight here, and hopefully I did that justice. I hope to avoid factual errors as much as possible in this video, and I hope that this is the most comprehensive presentation currently available in the Type I that relies directly on sources available to researchers and firearms enthusiasts today. Now, the information I use for this video comes from several books and online sources. For the print books, the Model 1891 Carcano Rifle, A Detailed Development and Production History by Giovanni Shega and Alberto Simonelli, Japanese Rifles of World War II by Duncan McCollum, and Military Rifles of Japan by Fred Honeycutt Jr. The Japanese Center for Asian Historical Records was a gold mine of information that I didn't even know existed prior to doing research for this video. This is where many of the original photo scans came from surrender lists as well as contract negotiations for the rifle. I also wanted to highlight a few noteworthy individuals. Aaron and Tristan, several members of the gun boards community, helped translate most of the information from the Japanese Center for Asian Historical Records. Aaron runs a blog on Mausers in China, which I will link to below in the video description. But I will leave a link to all these sources mentioned in this video in the description so you may reference them whenever you'd like. Again, if there's any information that is misconstrued or missing from this video, I'd love to see that. I think there's a lot to add to the history of this rifle that just needs to be dug up. But anyway, if you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time.